You're listening to a Monster Kid Podcast. <laughs> Weekend in your week. Rent a video. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Veracon Video, a show where we relive forgotten and unforgettable movies that once lined the shelves of video stores everywhere. I'm Brandon. And I'm Jordan. And today is our last day in Hollywood before we move on to a new theme, and what a day we have planned. Mm-hmm, exactly. We're taking on a detective case, or maybe it isn't, about a body in a lake, a rich man and his daughter, two sisters running in different directions, a pink wig, and a finger in a dog's digestive tract. If it sounds like it's right out of a dime novel, there's a reason for that. (laughs) We're talking Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from 2005. So sit back, relax, and welcome to L.A., and welcome to the party. Welcome to the Cafe 80s, where it's always morning in America, even in the afternoon to noon. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. I have the only gun on board. Welcome to Con Air. Welcome. To Jurassic Park. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, America, and welcome aboard Apollo 13. I'm so glad you could come. This is going to be such an exciting day. I hope you're enjoying it. I think you will. Two bit crook Harry Lockhart stumbles into an audition for a mystery film while on the run from the cops. Winning the party lands in Hollywood, where he's flung into a tangled, murderous conspiracy with his childhood sweetheart, Harmony Lane, and hard boiled private eye Perry Van Shrike, aka Gay Perry. You know, I was just thinking, this is, I think, the most recent movie we've done on this show. Really? I think we so. We haven't gone all the way into the 2000s yet. No, no hmm. further than 2001, I think. With A Knight's Tale. Knight's Tale, yeah. Right. And it's funny because knowing what we're getting into next week, we're going to go even further into the 2000s before walking back, I think, a little bit. Yes. So when you think of the video stores, you don't usually think of the dregs of the blockbuster era. You think of, oh, going to the 90s or 80s. But this was when I was going to video stores. So like picking up Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or Hell or In Bruges or any of these uh, 2000s favorites are as much a part of the video store mythos as the 80s ones, even if the Hollywood video down the street from you was in fact going out of business due to lack of sales. Yeah, I think, as a matter of fact, I bought this at a movie gallery Mm. that was going out of business. And I think that was just a blind purchase. I don't think I'd seen it before I bought it. Just like Gods and Monsters we talked about last time. This is one that just kind of stuck with me that I haven't seen in a while. But one thing that this film does well that I know you're going to get into more detail later is how it breaks the fourth wall. I thought maybe we could talk about some notable fourth wall breakers. Oh, my God. This is something that movies have been doing longer than most people think. Like one of the first movies to really play with with a lot of the, the, the functions of movie going and audience meets creation. It was a movie in the 1940s called Hell's a Poppin', which the, the entire thing was just the movie interacting with the audience, interacting with the movie again. It's literally just the most fourth wall broken, completely dissolved kind of movie. It's some of the zaniest shit possible. (laughs) I I imagine a lot of the people who made it a famous trope in film have studied it. I mean, I I talk about this later, but it's mostly a TV trope. Yeah, Yeah. Breaking the fourth wall is a lot more. You can name several TV shows that break the fourth wall. Malcolm in the Middle does it all the time. Fresh Prince of Bel Air, Boston Legal. Uh, there's a billion of them and they have fun with narrative versus who's telling the story versus interaction with the audience, with the narration, with everything. And I mm-hmm. love that. You can even just say any movie that really has a character interact with, like just talk to the audience, like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Or, That's the one that came to mind immediately. Yes, of course. The one that of course would come much later, but seems very similar in how it handles that fourth wall breaking is Deadpool. Yes. That is one of the modern ones that I think has made it a lot more accessible. Yeah. And I will say that the Kiss Kiss Bang Bang directly influenced the sort of mindsets that would lead to Deadpool. Right. And a lot of its its sisters, its unsuccessful sisters. Mm-hmm. And like, like Hellboy. Yeah. Fuck that. The, the Lionsgate one, not oh, the Guillermo del Toro one. Guillermo okay. del Toro one is great, <laughs> as is the sequel. I like both of those. Right. Deadpool, definitely. But even like lesser known ones like Cuffs. 
with Christian Slater. Oh, There's sure. a ton in that one. Yeah. Uh, you could also point to, and this is like, even in movies that don't usually break the fourth wall throughout the rest of it, you have like Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The very first scene of the movie where we introduce George Lazenby as James Bond, he looks at the camera and he goes, this never happened to the other fella. <laughs> Which, really? Is a complete yeah I miss exactly that? yeah it's it's very early in the film and it is the exact antithesis of Sean Connery where he doesn't get the girl and right. which is of course you know it's the entire arc of Honor Majesty's Secret Service where he gets the girl loses the girl has grief over losing the girl and that impacts the entire rest of the saga so but George Lazenby <laughs> basically said it's a camera hey, you weren't expecting this were you <laughs> but like it's been done a million times by a million movies both well and badly and it's a trope that I love because as a writer as a screenwriter and as a playwright I do love the sort of interaction between creator and creation mm-hmm. and the fact <laughs> that you can just sort of be derivative but like say hey we're being derivative I bet you're not gonna like us being derivative but look, I'll give you something fun at the end. Like, and that's right. what Shane Black does a lot of here. Yeah, like to acknowledge like, yeah, we're using this trope, but we know what we're doing. We know how yeah. that we're spinning this for this exactly. particular story. Right. It's, that we're not just <laughs> digging in the bag of tricks and just pulling shit out. It reminds me of the scene from, and this one was also improvised, the scene from Austin Powers' Spy Who Shagged Me, where Michael York and Mike Myers are going over all the ways <laughs> that time travel works. And he's basically saying to Austin Powers, and don't worry, you have nothing to worry about. And Michael York looks at the audience and goes, that goes for you as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot Which is about one of the that. best parts because Michael York improvised that, which is great. Oh, of course he did. Yeah. The last thing that I saw Michael York in was my boyfriend and I, we were watching Gilmore Girls. Oh. <laughs> he has a recurring role on that as a, oh, dear. Like a university professor who has an affair with one of his students. <laughs> well, sounds about right. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> Michael York, funny guy, has an exposition <laughs> from... Yes. British intelligence. Great in those. Yeah. yeah. I, I love all three of those movies. They're, I have a soft spot. I do but. too. Yeah I, go, yeah. I remember I took a girl out on a date to see a gold mm. member. That was like the best time I'd ever had. Like I, oh, man. I felt bad because I just kind of ignored her and, and just really got into the movie. But that, that was, was a good experience. <laughs> I, I We've all had dates like that. Like I... <laughs> I, I took a girl to see uh, Man from Uncle, and oh. <laughs> this was my second time seeing it. I, I I love that movie. That movie is like I still haven't seen it. It's excellent. It's it's honestly one of my favorite Guy Ritchie films, and I love most of his films. But it was the second time I was seeing it, and I was taking this girl to see it because I thought she would really enjoy it. And she most of the movie preferred to you know make out with me rather than watch the movie. And I'm like, okay, I'm in mid kiss. I'm like, dude, you watch the fucking movie. <laughs> I'm trying to enjoy this. I mean, yes, you're wonderful and all. Yeah. But like, so this look is, at look at fucking Henry Cavill. <laughs> it's like, this is yeah. what we came here to do. Exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute. You know, wa- wanting more to see a movie with, with, with Henry Cavill and mm-hmm. Annalisa Vikander than to actually make out with someone. How was that not the tipper that I was buying? <laughs> that entire, like pretty much everybody in that movie is like gorgeous. Even the cannibal. So, yeah. um <laughs> So I know, and I'm sure our listeners know, you are a Shane Black fan. Oh my God. And he's, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit about how you got connected to this movie. Right. So I went through a couple of his movies thanks to uh, Jack from RMR. He introduced me to uh, The Nice Guys and to uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, two absolute classics. Yeah. And I'd already seen like uh, Monster Squad and uh, Iron Man 3 by that point. Mm-hmm. Nice Guys and Long Kiss Goodnight made me a Shane Black fan, I think, for life. Because both of those movies are excellent. So I started uh, looking for the other ones. And Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I found at my local used uh, record and CD and whatever store. And I think it was a cheap kind of deal there. I I, I got it somewhere, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think I just popped it in one night, let it wash over me. And I, I genuinely enjoyed this movie. There is so much about what this movie did and does. That is the kind of stuff I like to do when I write. As we're going to get into, this is not my favorite Shane Black movie, but I think it's one of the best examples of Shane Black as an artist, as a writer and director, Mm -hmm. and as a creative gonzo mind. And I think this is the best picture of what he can do in a movie. Because he would later direct The Predator, 2018. I think that might be the only Shane Black film I have not seen. 
Ah, oh, well, I'm very, very curious to hear what you think about that because oh, I know, <laughs> I know that there's a thing in there. Uh, it, it's with Jacob Tremblay uh, playing an autistic character, which I think Jacob Tremblay might be autistic in real life. I think it was confirmed at some point. I'm not sure. Oh. Do not quote me on that. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Tremblay, if you're listening, I'm sorry if I'm wrong. But I think they did well in terms of representation and casting. Mm -hmm. But in terms of writing, I heard they fucked up. Yeah. I, <laughs> Which sucks because I love the first Predator. I know. Yeah. And he was, I didn't even realize that he was in the movie. Yeah. He was yeah. Hawkins. Yeah. Yeah. And I only knew so. that because in the end credits, it's, it's shot kind of like, like, like a, like a sitcom because it, oh, it just gives man. you like a snapshot, like a little clip of the character smiling and then it has like oh. Shane Black as Hawkins, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah, exactly. that sort of thing. But he also showed back up in RoboCop 3, The Hunt oh, for Red right, October. Right. Okay, good. Uh, oh, it says he was in Night of the Creeps as a cop. Makes sense. Yeah. That's Fred Decker's movie. Mm -hmm. And he was in yeah. As Good As It Gets oh. as Cafe 24 manager. Huh. Interesting. Swing State. He's done a little bit of everything, but mostly yeah. at, his career is as a writer. Yeah. I think out of the ones that he's done, the one that I enjoyed the most probably is Last Action Hero. Oh, yeah. I have to give that one another watch one of these days because I remember enjoying that, but I think I might have watched that before I watched like Nice Guys and Long Kiss Goodnight and all the really good ones that I love. So I, I need to just strap down and, and have that one delight me again because I, I remember that being pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Self-referential arm. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's give you guys a little background here. So this was written and directed by Shane Black in his directorial debut. It stars Robert Downey Jr., Val Kilmer, Michelle Monaghan, and Corbin Burnson. The script is in part inspired by Brad Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them, and interprets the classic hard-boiled literary genre in a tongue-in-cheek fashion. So following the poor critical reception of The Long Kiss Goodnight... Morons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a rejection letter from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. What? I want to know more about that. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> I know the the source that I found gave no like further detail on the reason for that. Any context. You should make a movie about that. <laughs> Shane Black's rejection. <laughs> yeah. Rejection starring and, and directed by Shane Black. Oh, gosh, you should. We should uh, hit him up and give him the idea. Yeah. Because he's got, uh, let me pull this back up. It said that he had a couple projects in development. Well, it's funny because one of the ones that he's been trying to do for years has been a Doc Savage movie. Oh, shit. Which ties directly into the sort of dime novel, pulp sort of genre that he's working with here. Yeah. One of my history teachers in high school would talk about that nonstop about how much he wanted like a live action Doc Savage movie. I mean, I know they'd made a movie, what, back in the 70s or 60s, uh, maybe, maybe. but like, it's like, that's what they need to make. And I was and after I read of a couple of them and it has like such great cover art and stuff. They're really, oh, yeah. really great uh, pulp novels. But yeah, I was like, I I've been waiting for that, too. So after he got his rejection and the long kiss, good night, got poor reviews. Shane Black decided he would attempt something outside of the action genre. So following the example of James L. Brooks, Black attempted to make a romantic comedy, a quote, quirky story of two kids in L.A. Brooks liked Black's first draft, but felt his later attempts were losing focus. Trying to salvage what he had liked, Brooks suggested Black imagine Jack Nicholson from As Good As It Gets playing Nicholson's role from Chinatown. <laughs> imagine getting that in like a writing workshop, like having that prompt. <laughs> it's just the two Jakes. <laughs> It kind of is. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine like another example. Like <laughs> imagine Jack Nicholson from Good As It Gets in The Shining. Imagine Jack Nicholson from As Good As It Gets in uh, The Last Detail. Oh, or as the Joker. I don't want to look at you. Oh God, as the Joker. <laughs> you make me feel like I want to be a better supervillain. <laughs> I can't do a Jack. But, you know. He's hard. He's hard for some people. Is, yeah. Robin Williams did an amazing Jack. Yeah, yeah, he's he's good at it. Yeah, but this this move led Black to add more action elements. And he said, you know, fuck it. I've got to put a murder in it and, and rework the screenplay, <laughs> adding the character of Detective Gay Perry, who Black said was an attempt to break stereotypes as he had never seen, quote, the gay guy who kicks down the door, shoots everyone and bails your ass. And we'll get to the whole gay thing because that's that's a yeah. whole other layer. <laughs> we, we, we've got to talk about that. Yeah. 
So the script then titled You'll Never Die in This Town Again was rejected by various studios before Joel Silver, who gave Black his first break producing Lethal Weapon and The Last Boy Scout, no stranger to this this show, uh, Mm -hmm. decided to help him out. The leading role of the now retitled LAPI had been considered for Benicio Del Toro, Hugh Grant, Johnny Knoxville. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. learned about the film from from his then-girlfriend, Susan Levin. Uh, who worked as Silver's assistant. And as he finished working with Silver on Gothica, uh, the producer in black brought him in to audition. Downey was eventually cast as they liked his readings and knew he could fit into the small $15 million budget as his career had been in a downfall following his time in prison. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Levin had also suggested to bring in Val Kilmer, who coincidentally had been long interested in making a comedy. Yeah. The thing about Val Kilmer, cause he's, he's a very strange case. Um, oh, sure. Just, he, like, like from everything I've read about him, he's just a very odd character. There was an interview that was put out last year. What he's doing basically is he's um, for for a while he was doing a one man show uh, as Mark Twain. Oh, right. Talking about Mark Twain in relation to Christian Science, mm-hmm. which is a, uh, a very odd uh, sect of religion. Uh, it's 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 Scientology for people who aren't weird. Uh, <laughs> Essentially, to any Scientologist listening to this podcast, uh, I'm sorry, but am I really? Uh, but like, he's he's doing a lot of stuff like that, and he's also, I think, had like a tracheotomy or something like that. Like, he's had some, yeah, some, yeah. He vo- like his vocal cords are right different. I'm not even sure if he's able to speak yet. I think he was doing some. I think he's got a voice box or something. Mm-hmm. He was able to give an interview, but uh, I'm not okay. sure how they did it. What they were saying, like what, what I think, like a colleague is was saying, is that Val Kilmer could have gone a, into a solely comedy based career because he did Top Secret. Top Secret was his first big movie. Yeah, and I love that movie. I have a soft spot for that. Oh, movie. it's great fun. Uh, it's 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 the same logic as Airplane, <laughs> um, but even sillier, honestly. Mm-hmm. If he wanted to, he could have done Saturday Night Live. He has that sort of comedy voices impressions kind of mindset sure yeah and but of course top gun comes calling and the rest is history yeah he was doing a lot of like action films like uh yeah well of course batman forever but also the saint and <laughs> yeah. uh was it, was, was it him in red planet i think it was it was yeah red planet another one alexander the great movie which he had to shave off all the weight in order to do this oh right he was in heat yeah heat yeah he does the Prince of Egypt as well, which awesome because <laughs> I love the Prince of Egypt. I mean, I'm not even that religious and I love it. Yeah, he um, was in Frankenheimer's The Island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> yeah, and that went well. Ghost, uh, in, <laughs> the Ghost in the Darkness. Tombstone, of course. Yes. Doors. Willow. I mean, so he's he's had a pretty varied career, uh, but, yeah. but, but just not a lot of comedic roles. Although I will right. say that in The Saint, he got to show off some of those comedic chops because when he would play these characters, when he would be in disguise, yeah. the Simon Templar character. But I think as far as comedy goes, I think the last thing that I had seen him in was uh, the Jay and Silent Bob reboot. And he, yeah. he was, let me see if I can explain this because it's a very meta film also. It's in the movie within the movie about right. Blunt Man and Chronic or whatever. But if you like Kevin Smith, you'll probably really like that movie. <laughs> It's fine. I had fun with it, but it's not that great. But I digress. Well, it's Kevin Smith. Before principal photography began on this movie, the title became Kiss Kiss Bang Bang because Black felt it was a blunt and austere title that described how the plot was half romantic comedy and half murder mystery. And to achieve a neo-noir look, Black screen 1960s films of the genre, such as Harper and Point Blank, mm-hmm. cinematographer Michael Barrett, and production designer Aaron Osborne. Osborne in particular drew inspiration from the detective book covers by illustrator Robert McGinnis. Hmm. He was also brought in to draw the covers for the fictional Johnny Gossamer novels that appear in the film. And also the Hollywood party that opens the film was filmed in Black's own Los Angeles mansion. <laughs> right. Which I, I was imagined he was able to afford thanks to the receipts from Lethal Weapon and the Last Boy Scout and all that. Indeed. So the, the whole film was shot in L.A. in spring 2004. The film debuted at the 2005 Cannes Film Festival out of competition on May 14th and was released in the U.S. on October 21st the same year. Right. If you want to watch this movie, you're going to have to rent it <laughs> on Amazon <laughs> or Vudu or something. Or you can find the DVD and Blu-ray pretty easily for very cheap. And they have ample bonus features. It has a commentary with yeah. Black. Uh, Robert Downey yeah. Jr. and Val Kilmer. It's oh, cool. It's not uh, streaming on any platform as part of a subscription at this time. But yeah, so just to kind of give you guys a little bit of context here, I'm not going to talk about other things that happened this year or what other films came out because I wanted to, to essentially present this question of like, why has this become somewhat of a cult film? Yeah, because 
I'll, I'll go over the cult aspect as well. Because this comes out in, in October 2005. I, th I, I always thought it came out in December, but I used to always confuse this movie with just similar dying um, title. Because I, I always confuse this title with um, Get Rich or Die Trying. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know. They, they must have been similar. But yeah, this this only makes a little bit of noise because A, 2005 is not a great box office year. Not a great movie year, honestly. But also, we're, I don't think by 2005 we're not we're really ready for the return of the R-rated bonkers action comedy yet because mm -hmm. this is four years before The Hangover. This is 11 years before Deadpool. Yeah. The true hard <laughs> R bonkers comedy needs more time to gestate and come back and needs more people like like Ryan Reynolds or even Cy Todd Phillips to really mm -hmm. gestate again. I do think that the cult status of this one rises once Robert Downey Jr. becomes big again with Iron Man, because that's another thing we need to talk about this. Mm -hmm. This movie is probably the movie that brought Robert Downey Jr. back. Right. Like, this is a this is a whole thing, because like, it's a tale of two leads, because this is the first return project for Robert Downey Jr., who, at, I mean, he has a very productive early 90s. He gets the Oscar nomination for Chaplin. He does Restoration, a lot of other shit. Gets caught up in addiction, started taking shit roles like U.S. Marshals and, yes, Gothica. <laughs> Has to leave his Ally McBeal gig to really get clean, does some time in prison. And after he does, like, The Singing Detective and a couple other minor roles, this is the start of his reclamation project. Sure. And yeah. Shane Black taking a chance on him here, thanks to his wife Susan, honestly, would lead a lot more doors to be open in the next couple of years in – Mostly indies, mostly like small non-box office projects like Charlie Bartlett and Zodiac. Sure, yeah. And then around 2006 is when his name comes into the hat for Iron Man. Right. If it weren't for this movie, I don't think he would have been on John Favreau's radar. And so you could make the case that this movie saved his career. And Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is the reason why Robert Downey Jr. is right now one of the biggest box office stars and one of the biggest celebrities in Hollywood. Yeah. And this was also just a couple of years later, he would be in Tropic Thunder, which was a <laughs> big commercial success. Yeah. And, like, uh, <laughs> and then he would pull out some, what was it? The Soloist. I think that one with uh, yeah, he would Joe, do Jamie like Fox. he would do his passion projects. Like he would do stuff like the Soloist and the Judge. But he would also do the big money makers like the Sherlock Holmes movies, the Avengers movies. Mm -hmm. um, he would try and do Doolittle, but we all know how that went. <laughs> oh, there was Due Date. Oh, Due Date is uh, Todd Phillips, but yeah, five years it's later, honestly yeah. underrated. Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny. This was yeah. was this kind of in the wake of the Hangover movies? It was the year after. The year it was after November 2010, and it was Robert Downey Jr. and Zach Galifianakis. Yeah, I love both of them so. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just the writing that really let me down. Oh, it's because it's a Todd Phillips movie, right? But you you make a good point. Like, not long after this, he starts building his credibility back up. Yes, as a reliable and sober performer, and he's getting yes. these great projects, and he's really turning on like whatever the fuck that is that he has. It's so damn good yeah. that he exactly. that you can see it in this movie. Like it's that oh neurotic. God. Oh yeah, he, it's what he's best at. <laughs> yeah, just that energy is so. It's so something <laughs> yeah, captivating. Exactly. And it's also interesting to point out that as this movie saves him, it's also the last big movie for Val Kilmer. Because mm -hmm. after this, he stops getting lead roles. And after a while, he starts getting roles. And he sort of transitions to where he is at now, where he's sort of dormant. Yeah. I know he spends a lot of time now with his art. Yes, he, that's the other thing. Yeah, he's got a like a workshop, and he paints and makes sculpture like metal metal work yeah. pieces and stuff. So you can go check out his website. And you can buy a yeah. bunch of shit from him if you want. Yeah, oh, of course. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, just before that, he was doing that one man show about Mark Twain. Yeah, which I think he um, might have written. Yeah, he did. Yeah, Robert Downey Jr. absorbs Val Kilmer's career powers. <laughs> Like a succubus. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. on point, actually. As, as I was saying before, one of the reasons that Kiss Kiss Bang Bang picks up as a cult project is because of Robert Downey Jr. And around the time of Iron Man, people started coming back to this one as, oh, this is how he got Iron Man. And then in 2012, Robert Downey Jr. reconnects with Shane Black and says, hey, I want you to do a Marvel movie. You could really be good at it. <laughs> and that turns into Shane Black directing and writing Iron Man 3. 
which I still like. I, I, I do like that one. It was a little bit neutered by the studio, but I, I think it's still very much a Shane Black film. Um, I haven't seen that one. It's it's interesting. It's it's pretty good. Is that the one with um, uh, Mickey Rourke? No, that's Iron Man 2. That one sucks. Okay. Um, <laughs> Iron Man 3 oh, it's Guy Pierce. Guy Pierce yeah. as the villain. Right. And they wanted Rebecca Hall as the villain, but then Disney said toy sales. Oh, so it'd right. be better to sell a male villain. Fuck that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really good one. I and around the time of that booking in that movie, I heard a lot of people saying, go back and watch Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. That's what they're going to try and shoot for. And that's, I think at that point, the cult began to grow for this one. I also think that this movie was a lot like the nice guys where the people who saw it in theaters rallied behind it until the rest of the world caught on. I mean, it sucks that 90% of Shane Black's movies are like that, but here we are. There was a reviewer talking about, like, if you took Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or The Nice Guys, uh, that those two films could have birthed a, a really interesting sequel. Oh, yeah. The Nice Guys needed a sequel. And I, I feel like I could have definitely used a bit more of The Adventures of Harry Lockhart and Gay Perry. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> that would have been great. But, of course, you know, these aren't the kind of movies that make money. They're the kind of movies that people like and then yell at studios when they don't fucking do anything. But, right. So, right. Yeah. And I'm, okay. I didn't even find much about the box office. So it didn't do great, but I don't think it was meant to. It probably did a lot more in home video sales and rentals. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's probably made back a lot of its budget in the last 15 years of people finding it. Yeah. Everybody comes to Hollywood. They wanna make it in the neighborhood. They like the smell of it in Hollywood. How could it hurt you when it looks so good? Shine your light now. All right, so let's okay. move on to uh, our uh, discussions here. So Yeah. So uh, I didn't title this part because I'm <laughs> I actually kind of like the title that you have. Okay. So I, I literally, the title that I have here is just central theme, comma, something about acting and anti-Hollywood. Because I was, I was waiting to, after I was done, have a snappier, essay-friendly title to it. But one of the big themes of this movie is Hollywood is not what the movies glamorize it as. Hollywood is a pit. It sucks. And people are going to keep coming into it expecting to find a Hollywood that does not exist. Because people flock to Hollywood because they want a career. They want to go into the movies. They want to act. And that is not an attainable goal unless you are pretty or a straight white man. Or, or maybe a fuckable blonde. I don't know. <laughs> but you never know how Hollywood executives think. Especially now. Mm -hmm. Literally the first scene of this movie is a parable for this sort of thing. It's Harry and Harmony's magic trick at a fair. And back in the day it's a flashback something. And it's a trick that looks so real and terrifying that, you know, it's, it, that Harmony's really being sawed in half. That Harmony's father is shocked to discover that it's, it's a trick. At which point <laughs> Harmony says, I'm going to be an actress. So if you can inspire real fear into the hearts of the dumb general public, then maybe acting is the next logical step. Thus is a parable that sets up the entire movie. A big theme in this movie is people coming to Hollywood to get famous and it never happening. Harry meets a girl at the party right at the beginning of the movie who describes herself as an actress, but via cutaway we see that she does porn. Right. Harmony hasn't been getting the part she's been wanting either after coming to Hollywood. She did get a Gennaro's beer ad. How boilerplate screenwriting is it to name a generic beer brand Gennaro's? Gennaro's. Uh, that's great. That's something only Shane Black can get away with. Um, <laughs> Harry is only doing his Hollywood stuff because he walked into the right door at the right time. Literally. By accident. And now his agent is grooming him for roles because he's a straight white man in Hollywood. And those have like five or six chances built into them. Almost like Robert Downey Jr. Um, <laughs> say what you will about like the Hollywood process, but like if he was a woman or if he was a person of color, he would not get as many chances as he had. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's something that Perry says to Harry whenever they're doing their detective lessons. Exactly. He tells Harry that this business, real life, is boring. Yes. It goes hand in hand with what you were saying about how it doesn't show Hollywood as this land of opportunity. We see the same effects of that lie, though, that we yeah. saw in L.A. Confidential, where we have all these people with these great aspirations and these dreams of success or making it, whatever that means, quote unquote, making it in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And all we see is people who see themselves as having failed or right. like they've been at it for so long. You know, and I read a lot of these stories on on Twitter, like people in, yes. who are screen working screenwriters, but they'll start out uh, as an assistant in some studio. And five years later, they might make it to, you know, a writer's room. And then maybe for another right. five years, they're running their own show. Yeah. And but I like reading those stories because it's it's a good reminder that these successes do happen. But 
Yes. For the majority, it's a lot of people who, you know, they're just living on that dream yeah. while they're waiting tables or, or working a day job. Yeah. It's interesting that the way Harry gets thrust into this whole scenario is that, you know, he's a crook, but then he just accidentally stumbles into this uh, audition. Yes. And he's not even wanting to be an actor. You know, he's just, mm-hmm. he's just a crook, but then he just shows up and then he just gets a chance. And so it just, to contrast that, I guess is what I'm trying to say with people like Harmony or was it Flicka, her friend? Yes. There's a, there's also a theme in this movie about celebrity being fake. A lot of lines at the bar scene with Harmony and, and Harry are basically about how lots of people in LA are rich and famous and look like celebrities, but are empty inside. Like, uh, I think it was Indian Billy Bob Thornton <laughs> or Native American Joe Pesci or punk rock Steven Seagal. The Native American Joe Pesci looks like Gary Shandling. A little. <laughs> I thought it was Gary Shandling at first. Hey, you never know. Uh, <laughs> I, th- I always think it's interesting when movies like about Hollywood play with this theme because clearly the people in the film have celebrity status or are yeah. on the cusp of gaining yeah. or losing a celebrity status. And I don't know, just seeing that tension between you know the fiction and real life is v- right. very curious. The other big theme in this movie is Harry pretending to be a detective as well as like he's pretending to be a lot of things. He's pretending to be a detective, an actor, a guy. The he says at the party he's the guy. <laughs> who invented to dice yeah, when he was a kid, uh, which is a great line. <laughs> great show. By the way. Yeah. So in a way he's acting for pretty much everyone and playing this role as a means to an end in order to please several different people at once. And then of course we like, you know, he, he gets so committed to the bit of being an actor that's at the peak of an uh, Harry and Perry arguments, which, <laughs> you know, he's been doing all these lessons to do a, to do a detective movie. Right. And Perry snaps at him. You're not going to get the part. Harlan Farrell wants too much money. And it's revealed <laughs> Then that Harry was only being groomed for the part to let Farrell come back down and take the role. He's been played just like everybody else. Right. Well, and because Harry has really gotten into it, like because things are really heating up. Harry's like, dude, you got to get on a flight out of here. You got to go back to New York. He's like, no, I I got my audition next week. (laughs) It's like, dude, you're not going to get the part. (laughs) It's like, listen to me. Listen to me. You're not Harry. You're not going to get the part. It's a great scene. (laughs) It is because he just won't give it up. Just completely. Yeah. (laughs) But no, I mean, it's, it's a great point. Like it's, yeah. it's like he has, you know, stumbled into this world and has taken hold of him or the allure of it. The other thing is about this whole playing a part thing is that Harry only agrees to take the detective guys once Harmony is on board with the case. Of course, he does it for the girl. Because he feels so, I mean, at, at one point, like even he's so hesitant to tell her about how much of a failure yeah. he's been or that he's just yeah. been living a life of crime. Because when they were children, she knew him as this fun magician. He was the great Harold and then later became the amazing Harold because he's amazing now. I was great. Now I'm amazing. Yeah, I was great. Now I'm amazing. He wants to kind of live up to what he thinks she is expecting him to be. Right. Going back to the, the, the whole thing about like imitating celebrity and, and, and obsession with celebrity in pop culture in sort of a cynical way. The fake name on the Johnny Gossamer tape is Lord of the Cock Rings, mm. uh, which is a porn parody of an established movie in order to make more money. Smut cut up to look like movie stars. I have a feeling that Lewis has a list of these. Yeah. He was going to cover a bunch of those with RMR, right? They got hold of Bat Pussy. That was the first one. Right, right yeah. <laughs> um, and Jack was over one time at my dorm, and we were figuring out which movies to watch that night, and he had Bat Pussy in the in the, in the background. I'm like, no, we're not watching that. And he's like, why? It's fun. Because no, no. Yeah, I had the impression that there were going to be more of those porn parodies that is from Random Movie Roulette. Maybe I'm not on the right Patreon tier. I mean, I think they made an OnlyFans for that. Oh, my God. Of course they did. Uh, I'm not as smut-minded as this Lord. <laughs> also, the Johnny Gossamer film that uh, within a film stars Michael Beck as Gossamer himself. So let's unwrap that. Michael Beck's big break was in The Warriors in 1979, mm-hmm. followed immediately by Xanadu, which kills his career because he was miscast in Cliff Richards, clearly lip-syncing all his sung dialogue. So we're saying that Michael Beck's eventual career dot drop-off led to him being in a Johnny Gossamer movie? Movie. really <laughs> okay so the footage that they're showing is from a real movie and i yes i remember finding the name of that i can't track that down again it's something that corbin bernson was in yeah or was that yeah yeah but i can't remember what it was Not i feel like either. that might have been in the imdb trivia at one point but i couldn't find it yeah. again what else has michael beck been known for like, not much like, <laughs> like was there anything beyond the warriors well let, let me look let me look uh so after uh xanadu Okay, not a lot of great stuff. Uh, the Golden Seal. 
a lot of TV stuff. Yeah, a, whole, a lot of lapses in his career. He does a couple episodes of Murder, She Wrote. Mm. If, you, if you're on the page, the most recent credit is The Warriors' Last Subway Ride Home. Look at that thumbnail picture. <laughs> also, he was in Force Warrior with um, um, Chuck Norris. Wow. Jeez. All right. Great. Yeah. Um, that looks like a geriatric bachelor party. Jesus Christ. Anyway, sorry. The Johnny Gossamer thing, I mean, it, it reminds me a little bit of, I mean, of course, the Brad Halliday stuff, but there was like a whole slew of like John D. McDonald and all these great mystery writers that just had this huge body of work that had rabid fans. I mean, Stephen King talks a lot about John D. McDonald paperbacks in, it, in his books because he grew up reading those and James M. Cain, but Ian Fleming, you know, mm. was in there too, I think, uh, even though he wasn't really a mystery writer, but he was also kind of in that stable of yeah, pulp writers ish. of the period. Yeah, pulp-ish, not necessarily along the same lines as, say, like the Harlequin romance novels or something like right. that, but dime mystery novels were incredibly popular, yeah. especially in the 60s. Yeah, and th this movie is structured a lot like a dime novel. It is. It, yeah. it takes the best qualities of a lot of that dime novel mentality, and uh, even the character names, Harmony Lane, mm -hmm. Gay Perry, Harry Lockhart, <laughs> You know, it's very much like an old timey, cheap mystery in the best way possible. Perry Van Shrike. What kind of name is yeah. that? Harlan Dexter. Yes, Harlan Dexter. A ton of those. Like the henchman, the bumbling henchman. Mr. Frying Pan and Mr. Fire. Right. <laughs> Which, uh, that's not a deleted lyric from um, Rankin Bass song. I'm Mr. Frying Pan. <laughs> I'm Mr. Fire. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, almost a Tarantino-esque kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Mr. Fire, Mr. Frying Pan. Why do I get to be Mr. Frying Pan? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mustard. Mr. Mustard. Yeah. yeah, even that banter I thought was Oh, yeah, that, funny. that's great. So, oh, I love that. Isn't that reference a little old-fashioned or whatever the line is? Yeah, no, it's, it's something that only Shane Black would do in the middle of a tense scene. <laughs> and I, I love that he still does it. Yeah. Speaking of Mr. Fire, right when he Mr. Fire returns in the pink-haired lady's apartment mm -hmm. and Harry sees the gun on the bed, Harry decides right there that he has to play the part of an action hero. It is a role that he hates because he has to kill people and hurt himself, and so he's better off as a regular actor. But it's <laughs> it plays into the whole he has to play roles kind of thing. That's a really cool scene because that when she gets shot and she falls down and she locks eyes with Harry who's hiding under the couch, and he's mm -hmm. just putting his finger over her lips like, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a great scene. And it's very sad, very tragic, but it does fire him up. And when he, he comes out of hiding and he just blows that guy away, unloads a whole clip into him pretty much. Yeah, Such he's a like, good scene. Yeah, he's just like, now I've got to do this for real. And even he, when he, yeah. I think that's even when he calls Perry. And he's like, Crying. I shot a guy. I've never done that yeah. before. It's a really cool moment. It is. And I'm, I'm glad that Downey is able to really convey that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the big other piece of this this theme is that uh, Harmony thinks she's nothing. That, and she's worthless because Hollywood has made her feel as such. Where she says to herself, there's always younger and there's always better. Mm -hmm. Statement about Hollywood. Stinging people's self-worth by shunning away 90% of the people that go away look, that go looking for it. Mm -hmm. And like by the end, the Gennaro's ad that Harmony was in, someone else is in it by the end. And it's the person that in the bar that, that Harmony was saying, oh, she's she's cooked. She's she's out of options in Hollywood. Yeah, she's. And the cycle will only continue. Was it the line like she's 35 or something? Still yeah. still acting or trying to act? Yeah. I didn't catch that that was her. I'm glad you pointed that out. I had, I had to look it up, honestly. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't the, sure. That whole ad thing, that CGI bear scares the shit out of me. It looks terrifying. <laughs> it's bizarre. I think it's supposed to look bizarre. Yeah. It's, it's a CG that, bear that, from 2005. It is, yeah. And uh, that bear, by the way, is voiced by Lawrence Fishburne. Oh, my God. Which I think it's just Ow. a pun. Hey, Lawrence, uh, you want to voice a CGI bear in a commercial that's in five seconds of my movie? Sure. It is literally five seconds. I would have never guessed that. His voice is unrecognizable, I think. Yeah. And he's, he goes uncredited in the movie, but he, it's definitely him. <laughs> so we talked about this a little bit when we got going yeah. here, but there are several instances of breaking the fourth wall in this film. Oh my God. Yeah. And there are um, some really great ones, <laughs> like really inventive yeah. ones. Some of my favorite all time fourth wall breaks in cinema history are in this movie. Um, but not your favorite, right? No, I think my all time favorite is in this movie. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Although I will say 16 walls from Deadpool comes very close, uh, mm -hmm. where there's a fourth wall break in, within a fourth wall break. And he's like, wow, it's like 16 walls. So, <laughs> but okay, I'll, I'm going to go over just a lot of the fourth wall stuff in this movie and what it means. Okay, so most of the fourth wall gags in this movie come from the narrative. 
comes right. from Harry as the narrator. Mm -hmm. Like literally, one of the first ones, uh, one of the fourth, first four of the world gags here is as as he's narrating himself at the LA party. He said, "You can hear the video. Uh, that's me there. My name's Harry Lockhart. I'll be your narrator." It just works because Robert Downey Jr. is so good as a self-deprecating narrator he does it again in iron man 3 so yeah he does that in another one too it's the um, what's the one where like the opening is cgi young robert downey jr was that civil war it might have been it was civil war yeah, yeah yeah but he does it in there as well yeah yeah he does okay so a lot of different narrative things that both shane black and harry do with a lot of these uh he plays with the audience as well as playing the everything you see in this film uh is what you came here to see mindset of filmmaking uh the line you might be wondering uh, how i ended up in la or maybe not you might be wondering how a silly putty picks up shit from comic books point is i don't see another goddamn narrator so pipe down so it he's the thing is harry is in control of the story he's not very uh, he's not a very good storyteller but he's in control of the story mm -hmm. and he knows that he's not very good at telling the story and so he's just having fun with you know being flagrant and honest about it it's it's almost like a variation on the all-knowing narrator trope in in books and, and media yeah where he mentioned the giant robot in regards to harmony's backstory and saying i'll show you that in like a minute and then a couple minutes later says oh shit i almost skipped this whole robot bit i made a big deal and then fuck oh this is bad narrating yeah so, so it's such a great moment because it's, yes. it's the whole was it proto cop yeah, Protocop. Protocop, yeah, which is just a ripoff of Robocop because there's even like the oh, little yeah. shootout in the, yeah. the the drug factory and stuff. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just that move, even the it's like the film stops and it, yeah. it's like he's it in, doesn't happen a couple times. Yeah, because it's like he's in control of that as well. So he's like, okay, yeah. well, let me let me go back. Yeah, let me get that <laughs> that other scene. So just seeing like the you put it as like the all knowing narrator, but he's almost yeah. like you know the master architect or master storyteller. He's the the guy behind the curtain running pulling the levers, yeah. you know. But he's not very good at it. It's one of his first couple times because right. he's just getting into the detective business. So <laughs> yeah, and then as you were saying about this, after the scene that sets up Dexter, as well as the exposition for his plot, the film just stops. He stops the film and he goes, like, okay, I apologize. That was a terrible scene. I mean, like, why is that in the movie? You think maybe it'll come back later? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and He's laying down. He knows that this is an ex expositional scene in line with what the narrative needs to be. He's even arguing with it. He knows this is a movie. He knows this has to operate by the laws of screenwriting. And he's separating that from logical storytelling. And like, we even get those explicit references like, to this being a movie. Yes. Which I think is, so many. yeah, which I think is really cool. It's crossing a lot of different lines there where Harry Lockhart, the character, he's telling the story, but he knows that this is a movie because we get that bit at the end when they're, I think we're going to talk about it at some point. But we are, yes. Yeah. But even just that, like the way the movie ends, it's very like, oh, thanks for watching. Yeah. I don't know. There's just something that hurts my brain a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still very much like, Going with the movie's goal to be entertaining. Right. Yeah. Like it's very much, okay, I am lawfully trying to make this an enjoyable experience for a moviegoer, even if I have to talk to the moviegoer myself. Yes. It's interesting like that. Then once we establish that uh, Harmony and Harry know each other from the past, where he goes, okay, I was a bad narrator in the beginning. And we point out that Harry and Harmony were those kids in the beginning. So, like, even though you could probably guess, like, or in this watch, I was like, okay, that's them. But, like, it shows the imperfection of the narrator. I, I say this somewhere in here. It's not exactly an unreliable narrator trope. Right. But yeah. it's just a disorganized narrator trope. I like that distinction. Yeah. Then as we, we flash back to that earlier scene, Harry has control over the direction of the film as well. I love this one. He's like, hey, why not put these two extras in front of the mammoth fucking lens? Boo, scat. <laughs> and he just, the, the extras move. I love that. That's one of my favorite fourth wall gags in cinema history, though not my favorite in this movie. Right. So remind me of this moment. Okay. It's the moment where they flash back and they do a, 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 a sort of a long panning shot over to the crowd of people watching um, the magic. The magic. Act oh, oh, and yes. Like, and though these two, these two people are in front of the fucking lens. Okay, boo, scat, get out of the fucking way. And they do. They do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So good. And then there's also a bit where Harry is narrating while also ogling Harmony in a present tense narration, as well as the narrator seeing the movie with us and being distracted by it. That's one of my favorite moments. Is this also oh, yeah. the, I should have told her I wasn't a nipple. I mean, detective. Bit. Yes. That that's, that's where is that delightful is. Delightful because you can also see Harry's reaction to that, like on screen, yes. but it's also like Harry, the narrator is watching along with us as you put it. 
Yeah. And both of those happening concurrently is pretty interesting, I think, as a narrative device. The rest of the film sort of goes on, and, and the, the real funny fourth wall gags don't really pipe up again until toward the ending, where this is just a great line that he has in the narrative, where as they've sort of figured out the case, and, and Harry goes, and you? How about it, film goer? Have you solved the case of the um, dead people in L.A.? <laughs> Times Square audiences don't shout at the screen and stop picking at that. It'll just get worse. <laughs> uh, so good. He can see the audience as well. And he's just assuming and he's making fun of New York as well. Fantastic. Yeah. And even like they're at the end, that bit when they're addressing the camera. Oh, yeah. Uh, where it's um, apologies to so viewers. In for, the, all the, for all you good people in the Midwest, I'm sorry we said fuck so much. Uh, <laughs> right. It's great. Now I get to talk about my all-time favorite fourth wall gag. This is fucking for the Pantheon. When uh, Perry wheels in at the end, having survived being shot and clearly dying. <laughs> Harry goes, yeah, boo hiss. I know. Look, I hate it too in movies where the studio gets paranoid about a downer ending. So the guy shows up. He's magically alive on crutches. I hate that. I mean, shit. Why not bring them all back? And as he says this, Shannon Sossaman, frying pan and fire and Abraham Lincoln come in. That's right. The happy ending is so happy that even Abe Lincoln survives the assassination. I laughed so hard the first time I saw this gag. <laughs> It's an even better version of the Chubbs, the Crocodile, and Lincoln ending of Happy Gilmore. <laughs> yes. It's such a meta gag and <laughs> such a hysterical extension of studio logic. Hell, even Elvis tries to walk in. I'd forgotten about that. I missed oh. the Elvis bit. But <laughs> I wonder if studio execs like this stuff. I wonder what, if they feel like this is going to confuse audiences. or No. This just seems very risky. They like it because they can laugh at these themselves and be like, okay, yeah, we would have made you um, change the ending to a happier <laughs> ending. I just and, I feel like a lot of this fourth wall stuff, especially with this being so bold and how much it does that. But again, Shane Black <clears throat> is pretty well established by this point. He could probably do virtually anything he wanted. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. It has to be done well, or it has to be done for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, I think all of these kind of are. Yeah. Just one example that I thought of earlier when we were talking about it, it's the very end ending shot of, or one of the last shots of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Oh, yeah. When Friar Tuck looks at the camera and says, let's go, let's get out of here. We waste good celebration time or something. And he starts <laughs> laughing. It's just like, what? Like, where did that come from? And we haven't done that up to this point. To be fair. <laughs> Mike McShane would be the kind of actor who would just suddenly playfully aside to the camera. That, that, I think that was probably improvised as well. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Because <laughs> Mike McShane was on Who's Line for the bulk of it in the UK. Mm -hmm. He's excellent. He is really good in that. Oh. I saw a lot of oh those episodes god. growing up. Oh my god. Yeah. His his stuff with Tony Slattery is among some of the best uh, stuff of that era. I like Tony um, Slattery. He, he's great. Yeah. He's, the one thing about Tony Slattery is that like... Towards the end of him being on, he was drinking a lot, he was doing a lot of drugs, and he was not doing a great job of coping with his bipolar disorder. And so he was just deteriorating on a number of the shows in like 95, 96. So they basically told him to stop being on. And uh, because of that, Mike McShane also left. So, uh, But he, he's excellent. As we get to the epilogue, which is another scene of Perry basically telling Harmony's abusive dad to fuck off, where he goes, and don't worry, I saw the last Lord of the Rings. I'm not going to have the movie end 17 times. <laughs> there is, though, one final scene for your viewing pleasure. So that's it's a very RDJ way of, of doing that. What follows that is the moment where Perry goes to visit Harmony's father. What did you make of that scene? It was closure on the whole arc starter of him being an abusive fuckhead. Right. And it yeah. was Perry basically, Perry, the character that in any other movie would be the butt of any joke, telling this guy to fuck off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. That's true, yeah. I guess yeah. I kind of wanted the guy to get a little more punishment, perhaps. <laughs> well, the guy was kind of dying. He was dying, yeah. So he'll get his. Yeah. yeah. Even though Perry says that he's a bad guy, he's really not. He, he might be a difficult personality, but. He's not the bad guy. Mm -mm. He's, he's the most lawful, obedient character in the movie. Yeah. And then there's that ending, which is shot. On a camcorder, just Harry and Perry right to camera. I think it was shot after production wrapped because Val Kilmer has a beard. And so I right, assume it yeah. was for the cans premiere. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's one more meta take because he's talking directly to the audience, thanking them for coming. Perry shuts him up and another a couple more meta lines. That's it. Please stay for the end credits. If you're wondering who the best boy is, it's someone's nephew. <laughs> Don't forget to validate your parking. And for all you good people in the Midwest, I'm sorry we said fuck so much. It's just... <laughs> Oh, it's so that's amazing. It is. I, had, I completely forgot. I mean, I remembered a lot of these fourth wall things, but I had completely forgotten just how this movie wraps up. It just, just, just leaves you with something that feels good. It does. A very fun and entertaining movie to end with something so playful and, and silly. It'll make an audience feel validated. Yeah. 
they're playing the game along with us. Mm-hmm. In terms of what this and what all this fourth wall gag stuff means, in terms of you know both in the, in the film and for future films like this. I mean, narratively, I've, as I've said, this it means Harry's in charge of telling the story. He's not a very good storyteller, so he's continuing to be neurotic and self-effacing throughout. It's not quite the unreliable narrator type, more of a disorganized narrator. It also ties into Harry being pretty well versed in Hollywood, so he knows what makes a good movie, even when he's narrating one. The madness just comes from him living in LA. I think because this is a very fuck Hollywood movie, him being this sort of fourth wall breaking narrator could adds to the fuck Hollywood mindset because Hollywood also includes the confines of how a movie is supposed to be and oh, how sure. a script is supposed to go. And this character is so anti Hollywood that he's going, fuck that, I'm going to do it my way. Mm-hmm. Just the fact that, I mean, these are Hollywood actors. This is a film being made in Hollywood. But mm-hmm. but also to make it about Hollywood and the Hollywood experience and the perils of it, I don't know. I still haven't really quite settled on how I feel about that or what wh- I feel like there's something there that I just I haven't been able to articulate in my head yet. There's a piece of the thesis missing. Yeah, I, I guess just being a part of the system that you're critiquing. At the same time, Shane Black was sort of spat out by the same industry that he is trashing in this after Long oh, Kiss Goodnight. Right, right. He's doing this as a sort of indie ish kind of thing. Yes, Joel Silver is producing, but this isn't exactly a studio film. This is outside the confines of the system that he is lampooning. Right. I yeah. mean, Iron Man 3 would be a studio film, as would The Nice Guys and I think Predator. But this was a fuck Hollywood movie that was allowed to be a fuck Hollywood movie because Hollywood was really not having a lot into it. Like the way that they worked this, Shane Black really only had to answer to Joel Silver, who he was friends with. He didn't have to answer to any other producers or people at the at the, the studio. Right. He just made his movie and Joel Silver was like, okay, this is good. That's how it worked. So it was a very un-Hollywood sort of production. He had jabbed at Hollywood a little bit in Last Action Hero. Be- right. Like there was the big movie premiere for the next Jack Slater movie. Jack Slater, the character meets Arnold Schwarzenegger, the actor. Yes. And Arnold is like, oh, you're the you're the best lookalike I've ever seen. Right. We should do uh, appearances. Call my <laughs> office. You know, I guess like he was playing with some of those ideas, I think, back then in 93, 94, whenever that was. But also Last Action Hero seems a bit more pro-Hollywood to me because it's yeah, yeah. in favor of a lot of the tropes, I think, that action movies tend to go with. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's pointing them out and subverting them slightly. But, and I also think about the premiere scene where there's like 9,000 studio mandated cameos in that. Right. And yeah, so true. I think it's a little bit more mixed into Hollywood than, than this one, obviously. Yeah. Now I can see that too. I was just thinking right. in terms of contrasting those, like in the yeah. ways that he is lampooning certain aspects of Hollywood or Hollywood culture. Yeah. For a mainstream action film to be this meta at this point is nearly unheard of. Like on TV, it happened all the time and all the TV shows I mentioned at the top of the show. Uh, they've been doing that for years for a movie, a serious type action movie, though comic, to hit that fourth wall that many times. That was relatively new. Comedies had done it, like Wayne's World and Spaceballs and such, but not many mostly serious types of films. And so Kiss Kiss Bang Bang doing this directly paved the way for movies like Deadpool and Harley Quinn mm-hmm. to break the fourth wall as many times as this one did. Do you recall like having seen like these kinds of moves outside of comedies or action films? Uh- Okay, well, horror would do horror, a Horror, of course. Yeah, definitely. There's there's a ton of those. I mean, yeah, it was a lot of Mel Brooks movies that did things like that. Mm-hmm. I guess it wouldn't really serve much of a, a narrative purpose in just a straight drama. I feel like this is going to be a there's recurring a uh, segment. Is this movie a Christmas movie? Well, it's a Shane Black movie, so there's always a chance. <laughs> okay, so a lot of his movies are take, take place either on Christmas or on Halloween. Uh, this is another Christmas one. Uh, I tried to look for little things... Mostly it's set decoration yeah. that he hides in there. Like the opening scene in LA takes place on Christmas with a, like in a Christmassy sort of, like, I don't think any of these take place on Christmas. I think they're all for four Christmas, but it's, it's a Christmas party ish kind of thing with uh, a Muzaki sleigh ride a playing and a Santa hat floating past a swimming blonde. As, as Harry walks in to find the guy making a move on passed out harmony miracle on 34th street. The original is on TV. Right. As Harry and Perry fix the body and throw it in the dumpster, a theater marquee behind them, Making this a beautiful shot, by the way. Yeah. Reads a very nice Happy Holidays. That's a great shot. Um, great shot. Oh, yeah. I love that. That I That's one of the – like one of the shots from this movie uh, is currently my cover photo on Facebook. It's a shot of him hanging from the uh, the road sign by the corpse's hand. A lot of great shots in this movie. That It's wonderful to look at. For a lot of this movie, Harmony has on a Christmas hat and dress. Mm-hmm. We see her take it off. Uh, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, that was nice. 
Even the mental clinic is decked out in Christmas stuff, which is odd. I mean, honestly, I think if you took Christmas out of this movie, it wouldn't suffer. Mm, no. It's just set dressing, arguably, like a lot of Shane Black's movies. Sure. Except for Lunk is Good Night. That is a Christmas movie. So I don't know if this one is a Christmas movie, but it's christmas E in its location and sets. It has all the trappings, but I don't think that there are any like, central plot points that revolve around Christmas stuff. Right. Exactly. You know. It's just part of the setting. Right. Okay, so we told you we'd get to the gay thing. So here we are with Gay Perry and Queer Theory, perhaps. Yeah. Since it went so well during the Gotham Monsters, I wanted to tackle uh, the character of Gay Perry from the standpoint is Mm -hmm. of, is Shane Black doing this correctly? Shane Black is a straight white guy uh, writing a openly gay character. And he wanted to do that because he wanted to subvert the trope of the sort of hero cop being, oh, let's just have me a gay guy. Uh, which is fine. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, well, let's just go into some of the stuff that he presents to us about the character of Gay Perry, yeah. which who's also played by a straight actor. Uh, Val Kilmer, I believe, is openly straight. Yes. Uh, yeah. Unless, I don't know. But uh, anyway, <laughs> um, the VO that Harry has upon setting up Perry as a major player and socialite, also he's gay. Completely incongruent to his success. It's just another dimension to the character. Ten years earlier, it'd be, hey, look at this gay guy. Also, he does other things. Right. Which it can yeah. be at parts in this movie. but Yeah. I don't know. You might be getting to this in a moment. But to me, it feels like the whole gay aspect of Perry's identity feels very tacked on. It does feel like Val Kilmer can turn it off in some scenes. Like, it doesn't always... It's not every facet of this character. It's just, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good for occasional plot-related moments or just for... Like, oh, yeah, he's gay. But it's not exactly as like seamless of a drapery over this character as it would be if there were actually queer people involved with shaping it. Right. You know? Yeah. So it doesn't really, like, if you took that out, I don't think we'd miss a whole lot. There's a couple. There's a, of, there's a couple of good jokes. Right. Okay. That, exactly. that pay off because of the straight reference. But. Right. But I think besides just him making a few passing comments about the guy who got away or yeah. or I saw that guy in the cafeteria, what's he, 6'4", all that kind of yeah. stuff. I'm a little conflicted right. about that. But honestly, <laughs> I mean, this this goes right into, like, this this mindset goes into the conversation that Larry Miller as Dabney mm-hmm. has with Perry about, you see a naked guy and your brain says, I want them. What are we to make of this? Is this the straight mindset of everything looks gay to you? How is this seen as a hindrance to the straight minded Dabney? I feel like I've had this conversation with people yeah. where they ask me, like, so when you look at a guy, like, are you attracted to them the same way that I like women? It's not exactly how it works. It's like, it's, it's, no, it's, no, of course not. Everyone has different sex drive. Right. But people want like a very clear analog that they can <laughs> import and understand. And so I, I think yeah, Dabney is kind of making that move where you know, he's trying to understand. I'm trying to think of how this appears in other films. Uh, I know it happens in, in in and out, but even for my personal life, I feel like I've had this conversation before where it's the battle between the straight mindset and the gay mindset trying to come to some agreement or right. understanding about how we see the world, which is something we addressed somewhat in the Gods and Monsters episode. Right, yeah. He's, he's saying like, okay, be careful out there. Like, it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, I'm, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your instincts or something like that. Like, how? Oh, right. Yeah. So it's not like I'm worried about you in terms of like, like, oh, you're you're more vulnerable because you have these yeah. sensibilities. You know, that's how he's it's seen just it. I'm worried you're gonna fuck the wrong guy because that's apparently all you do. Right. <laughs> all right. Well, well, uh, okay. One of the first um, exchanges that Harry has with Perry is he has, he asks him, still, "Still gay?" No, I'm, I'm knee deep in pussy. I just got, I just like the name so much. Um, One of my favorite very lines. Shane <laughs> very Shane Black, and it's just yeah. delivered so dryly mm-hmm. by um, Val Kilmer and very straight. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know. Huh, well, now you mention it. Yeah. Like, no, and then, like, as as Harry brings up uh, the one girl from high school who got away, uh, Perry's answer to that is Bobby Mills. You know, easy joke, but, you know, fine. Yeah, because Harry's even like, I got five bucks that says you uh, can still get with him. <laughs> it's like he's trying to be, uh, I don't know, supportive or... Something like that, yeah. Some semblance of support. I'm not, I'm not really sure what it's, that is. It's a weird support. It's a weird, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, let's talk about the way that Val Kilmer's playing Perry. There is a slight lisp. Although, does the character have a lisp because Val Kilmer is trying to play gay? Or does the character have a lisp because Val Kilmer is playing him? I've really got to get you out of those clothes. Excuse me? And into a black dress. Tell me, doctor, do you like the circus? I mean, okay. I didn't really hear it that much. 
I heard a little. I heard it just a little bit. And so I couldn't tell if it was intentional or if it was, I can't remember if we talked about this when we did the commentary for Batman uh, forever, Mm -hmm. but I, I remember talking with you or somebody about that lisp and someone commenting that it, it was intentional or like something to sep- yeah. distinguish in Batman forever. It was intentional. He would have a lisp as Bruce Wayne and no lisp as Batman. Right. Okay. So we did talk about that. So yeah. I think Val Kilmer can not accentuate his lisp as much. Although I think here it's a little accentuated and I think he's lisping a bit, uh, just not much, not mm. broadly. Right. But there's a slight lisp. I I feel like he was not believable as a gay character. Well. What do you think? He has moments. Yeah, he does have some moments. The (laughs) one thing that Shane Black did that worked with this character is that only Harry is able to say the F slur. Mm -hmm. Like, the little gun in the glove box, the the F gun, because it's only good for a couple of shots and then you got to drop it for something better. (laughs) Said straight faced, bluntly, from experience. Honestly, I think this is like the the couple of queens joke from uh, Gods and Monsters. We are on the side of the joke rather than laughing at it from the opposite side. Right. As you put it in that episode, it was played for polite laughs. Exactly. Yeah. And that's honestly what it is. That's what this is a bit more vulgar than that. Right. It's one of my favorite jokes because it is one thing that Kilmer does well here. It's the delivery, like just how straight, pun intended, Mm. it's delivered. And it's also setting up the whole. Uh, the Derringer and how it will come into play later. Right. Uh, Perry plants himself on Harry only to distract the cops and make them drive away, playing into their own homophobia rather than letting them uh, chase the real mystery. It's right. Strategic yeah. gaiety. Strategic gaiety. That's a, that's yeah. a term. I like that. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But, yeah. Well, I feel like we've seen similar Ooh. scenes with, you know, a straight couple or, yeah. you know, a, a man and woman. It's like, oh, OK, well, look like we're together. Yeah, uh, we've seen similar scenes in Bugs Bunny cartoons, <laughs> but not but not to distract anybody else. Yeah. It's an odd piece of subterfuge to distract the cops. What is it? Uh, Harmony says, like, why was he I forgot the word? There's a verb, very special verb. She used necking, necking uh-huh. or some, it's, um, it's something like necking. It's close. Either way. Yeah, but anyway, they, they don't really resolve that. Like they don't have that conversation. I think they just cut to it in the car and the narrative. I was able to convince. I was able to convince her a that I was still a detective and b that I wasn't gay. I have no idea how I was able to do either. Right. Or I think it was yeah. don't ask me how I did the latter or something. Yeah. Like don't that. ask me. I can, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Perry is essentially the one who does all of the work. Always has the upper hand over Harry. Does all this good lawful stuff in order to aid the case. Mm -hmm. The gay character is the one who is almost completely in control for most of the movie and is essentially the hero of the piece while being unabashedly queer, even if it has to play straight presenting a lot of the time. And I wonder if that's maybe why, I don't know. That's an interesting layer there because if we talk about Perry in terms of straight presenting and look at, I guess like how he is presenting himself or maybe why the lisp comes in and out you yeah. know, like that, that there is an, an intention to, yeah. to, to hide or tamp down some of those behaviors or, or exactly. Quirks. He's got to, he's got to be presentable to a predominantly heterosexual audience. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like how I do a lot of masking for a predominantly neurotypical audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. This movie is no stranger to the cheap gay joke. Uh, mm-hmm. Perry recognizes Mer- Michael Beck from Xandu which Harry uses to clue in harmony that Perry is gay. Hey, some people like that movie for the kick-ass soundtrack done by ELO and Olivia Newton-John. It doesn't denote sexuality. (laughs) Uh, uh, I've never Uh, seen Xanadu. It's not a great movie. Okay, okay. It's it's very much just an excuse to have good music numbers written by Jeff Lynn and done by Olivia Newton-John, Gene Kelly, and Cliff Richard. Mm-hmm. It's a very empty end of the 70s, early, because it came out in 1980, so it's very much a 70s movie, just happened to be in the 80s. It's very empty, it's very dated and bad, uh, but the soundtrack is good. The, the song All Over the World that ELO did comes from that soundtrack. Oh, really? And yeah. It's an, I love that song. Good song, yeah. It's so good. It's it's the uncredited song for the movie Paul as well, that's how I knew, I knew it. Mm. And. The other really cheap gay joke um, in terms involving music is uh, Perry's ringtone is I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. Of course it is. <laughs> sure. I can see like that being one of the things that peeks through the cracks of that straight presentation or, or mm. how or how that it could be read as this. Uh, oh, well, his, his ringtone is I Will Survive. So, of course, he's gay. <sighs> 
you know, yeah, right, right, right. I don't know. It, it just, that is like a, like an outing device almost yeah, like and, and made it something slightly more subtle. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. YMCA. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have the dick gun. We kind of have to talk about the dick gun. Yes. Because <laughs> this is, this is how he subdues one of the, one of the goons that is, uh, interrogating, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. And he basically reaches into his pants and pulls out his tiny gun there and shoots him several times and he remarks homophobes never check there <laughs> um what are we to make I, I, of I was gonna ask you the same thing i had a note <laughs> <laughs> that uh way that he's getting at this goon is to say oh you ever been with a man calling him gay and the guy doesn't like it and so he just becomes yeah. more and more agitated yeah he just he just creates like a distraction or he's like you know reaching into his pants and the guy's kind of repulsed by it and he just pops a few shots off in him you know <laughs> <laughs> it, is it really in Black's best interest to write this character so lowest common denominator mm. at some points? I mean, I feel like he, as a straight guy, only knew so much about writing gay characters. And while he did an all right job, went for the stereotype a few times because that's what he thought he could do. Right. But, yeah. I mean, that's really the one thing about this movie that I, I still haven't really nailed down how I feel about yeah. it. Because yeah. there's that line. Uh, what is it? Harry tells him, oh, don't don't quit your gay job. <laughs> yeah. And then later towards the end, after they've, uh, I think they're in the hospital and they've survived the whole thing on the bridge. And Perry's like, Oh, the present talking to Harry, the present is that you're not in jail fag hag. <laughs> and so that's kind of for the record, the, the don't quit your gay job thing. I know it's a Shane black line because it has the exact same, uh, energy as in one ear and out the rubber from, um, uh, lethal weapon two, which mm. he did the spec. He did the, the first ref or I don't think that line was his, but it has the same energy. I didn't find that particularly offensive or anything. I, no, I mean, I'm not saying it was offensive. I'm just saying it's a cheap gag that, oh, um, yeah. that refers back to a movie long runner, sort of like the, in lethal weapon two, the, the runner that Murtaugh's daughter is in an ad for condoms. Oh, right. It's teetering a line, but, but it's, it's done so playfully, but yet at, at yeah. times when it does veer over into the stereotypes, it does leave you with this yeah. kind of sour taste yeah. where you're just like, mm, I don't know about it's, that. It <laughs> skirts that line. It does. And it's a, it's a line I wish he wouldn't skirt so much. Like, like there's a, there's a line late in the movie that's a cross-dressing reference and the, it's immediately followed by him lusting over a nurse. You know, he doesn't know he's gay. Look how he walks. It. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't have to be this lowest common denominator. He he could just make him just a progressive character by t meeting with um, the right kind of people to write this character. But he decided to do it this way and fine. At the end of the day, I mean, it's what you said. Like he probably just wasn't capable or knowledgeable enough to, to write a yeah. gay character. <laughs> well, probably not. He tried. He tried. Let's talk about Shane Black some more. Oh uh, my. Okay. This is my strengths. So I love talking about Shane Black. So let's talk about the script. This movie has chapters like a pulp novel. Uh, so it works within segments. I think it's like a five different segment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it works like a five act script like James Cameron would do. Right. But it works in that sort of like chapter kind of thing. And I really dig that. I think that's a cool way of doing things. Tarantino yes. would do that as well. Yeah, Tarantino would do that. It it also harkens back to Raymond Chandler specifically had yes had structured a lot of his work that way. He was trying to pay homage to Chandler a bit. Yeah, this dialogue in this movie is excellent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of oh my god back and forth exchanges. Don and Robert Downey Jr. and Val Kilmer are perfect for this as well. They are both fantastic as spitting out a lot of this really sharp dialogue without making it seem like they're above it or the dialogue is above them. So it, yeah. it's, it's very natural. I mean, even just the exchange when they're in the car about the towel, like the wet towel. Yes. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. That's great. The whole thing was about Harry had a towel that he used to wipe off his shoes and he gave it to, yeah. to Harry and, and he gave it to, and he's, to why does the towel it. have to be wet? And it's just this whole back and forth thing, but so good. the banter is so funny. He, Shane Black is amazing. It's back and forth banter, especially with a sort of like buddy duo. Mm -hmm. Like it worked with Damon Wayans and Bruce Willis. It worked with uh, Danny Glover and uh, Mel Gibson. Sure. It worked with Samuel L. Jackson and Gina Davis. Right. And of course it works with Russell Crowe and uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah. So he's fantastic at doing these dual dynamics and really having them bicker wonderfully. Where's my gun? I, uh, no, I, uh, give me my gun. No, I, I, I got rid of it. Say again? 
Yeah, I threw it in the lake because I figured you wouldn't, I would. I got priors in New York, so I really can't, I can't be messing around. You with threw that. it away? Yeah, plus it's evidence. It's what? Watch it. Okay, relax. okay, oh no, I'm sorry. I, I got a little non plus there. Okay, cool. this is crazy. I understand. No, Just it's relax. Just, whoa, what is that? Is that a, is that a clue? What do you mean? Do you see that? In the thing? Can you? Ow! What were you thinking? My $2,000 ceramic vector my mother got me as a special gift? You threw in the lake next to the car. What happens when they drag the lake? You think they'll find my pistol? Jesus. Look up idiot in the dictionary. You know what you'll find? A picture of me? No. The definition of the word idiot, which you fucking are. Yeah, I love a good bickering scene. Yeah. I, even just that, that moment where Perry tells Harry to sleep badly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there's this whole thing about, oh, badly is an adverb. Who taught you grammar? Vanish. Oh, yeah. That entire running gag between <laughs> it's Harmony and Harry later, and then Perry uses it wrong. Harry calls him on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What Chain Black is really good at is making an idea that seems formulaic interesting by flipping tropes, pointing out tropes, playing with expectations, so you're not sure how lawful or how experimental he'll be in any given moment. He's a lot like this in Nice Guys as well. Mm -hmm. When I first saw this movie, I was really caught off guard by like how it was structured. Like I didn't know how this movie was going to go. I mean, because of Harry as the narrator, you have this person who's in control of things, but is so bad at it and so uh, unpredictable you don't know where you're going to you're going to be carried to next it's what you were saying about taking something that was seemed formulaic and and being so experimental or being so i keep saying playful a lot in our yeah. episodes but it's a playful movie shane black's a playful director yeah i really admire that his reputation even though he was rejected by the academy of motion picture arts and sciences <laughs> Why? he could do that like he could afford to be that playful yeah. And take those risks. What's he got to lose? Yeah, exactly. Right. Black uses parables in this, one of my favorite screenwriting devices. The opening parable is acting as a means to shock and fool the audience. Then Harry talking about the Johnny Gossamer novels and just introducing several plots and slowly revealing that they're all connected before the movie introduces a similar tactic. I, I, I love scripts that do this, and Shane Black will do this a lot by using other texts or other things to sort of predict the way the actual narrative is going to go. And it's, it's great here. Yeah, because Harry will point to those Gossamer novels and say that yeah. Johnny Gossamer always had two cases that were connected in some way. Yeah. And that's becoming the case for Harmony's case, but also the case of the, the woman that they discovered in the yeah. lake. Right. And how these things are going to intersect and overlap. And he's kind of overjoyed by that, like to make that connection when he's, he calls Perry to tell him that my case right. and your case are the same case. Exactly. Which is great. but. I will say, though, and this is one of the few problems I had with the script, the speed of Harry connecting Alice and Ames and Harmony's sister, then getting his finger cut off and Harmony being right back with him was way too rapid. That's a lot of very big events that happen in a, a small, a way too small of a window of time. Right. Is like, also, just the way that Harry getting its finger lopped off is used so matter-of-factly mm -hmm. in this film. Yeah. Like, it's, it's going to be a big deal. He, he doesn't even seem to be that much in pain. Because like if I if I had my finger cut off, I'd be like wincing. This movie does move pretty fast. It does, and there are moments where it does feel like you don't really have a moment to breathe or to really kind of take everything in that's being thrown at you. It, it's it's something that I feel like we ran into in Hudson Hawk. There were a few moments oh, like that, yeah, where you're like, hold on, let's pump the brakes, give us let's let's yeah. let's breathe for a moment, right? But I guess like there was just so much ground to cover in what this movie is like an hour 40 or just, just a little yeah, over and we're all over LA in this movie. It's really no surprise that we get some of those moments where it's like, yeah, we've, we have to make some sacrifices in order to keep this moving. But I will say one of Shane Black's, one of his best tropes is the disarming of a goon almost comically Perry doing the disarming routine on the goon that holds them up outside of the mental hospital. That's great. Cause it's done so smoothly and and so like like it, it dissects the trope while also taking part in it that's a lot of what shane black does here i haven't seen a shane black movie in a while but what about the whole like bumbling henchman thing like because the, oh, yeah. the bad guys in this movie yeah. are not very good no. at, at being bad guys because i'm thinking about the moment where the bad guys are about to get into that van and yeah. harmony steals it and she literally drives away with the van doors swinging open yeah while they're they're yeah. deciding on like who's going to ride up front or who's going to drive yeah. it's that kind of thing no that's that's a shane black trope yeah. cuz <laughs> the, the the i think of the goons in uh the nice guys cuz okay. there's the the one that has the like the the blue stain on his face for most of the film so there's a couple of semi unsuccessful goons in iron man 3 but yeah, it's something that he'll use, especially contemporarily. Yeah. Okay. So the direction here. Oh yeah. This is his first movie and, uh, mm -hmm. it's a solid it's effort. 
It is, yeah. I mean, for a first-time director, black comes off really comfortable here. And this one has a specific look and feel while also being slick and accomplished. It's very hard for a movie from this period, especially 2005, to look unique. And this one does. Because 2005, they're like the dregs of the movie bit going. Everything looks too gray or too filtered or too boring. Like this this pit of the 2000s, I hate. There's a lot of movies in 05 and 06 that look horrible and look the same. Mm -hmm. And this one does not look that much same to a lot of the other ones in this one. Mm -hmm. Children of Men's like that too because that's a 2006 movie that looks very different. Yeah, I mean, this film, um, I think, has a very aesthetically pleasing color palette. Yes. It has great uh -huh. cinematography. And yeah. it feels, maybe this is just like my first impression of it, but at times it felt like like a, like a graphic novel in motion. A little bit. Like, it's not overly stylized, but I can't really put my finger on it. it we get that opening sequence. The, oh, the yeah, that's great. I love that. Yeah, it's animated. It's a little bit of a nod probably to like spy films. It feels like a Saul Bass kind of deal. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So I really like that. That just really does a great job of setting the tone and yeah. that, that this is going to be playful. This is going to be fun. So I uh, remember last episode when I promised a Gilligan cut this week. Yes. The shot of Perry and Harry with the body seeing the roof access sign and then cutting right to checking the body off the roof. Perfect Gilligan cut. I love those. I love a good Gilligan cut. I think people don't use them enough, and I think this is a great one. Whenever I saw that rewatching it this morning, I thought, yeah, there, yeah. there's that cut. Yeah. But I wanted totally. to ask you. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's the scene where Harry is telling that guy at the party to get away from drunk harmony. You know, it's past my bedtime and make a choice and all that. And then we immediately cut to him getting beaten on the lawn. Does this, quali oh, yeah. does this qualify or is this like a variation or is it something else? I think else? it works as a Gilligan cut. Yeah, because it's like it's basically just saying, you know, oh, you know, either either you're gonna do this, either I'm gonna beat you up, or you're gonna beat me up. What's gonna happen? Cut to Robert Downey Jr. being beaten up. Yeah. So it is basically <laughs> a Gilligan cut. Yeah, that's a great cut. It is. No, I mean Shane Black is great at like just great cutaways or just like, like he's he's very good at like fun stuff with with keeping the narrative going like that. Yeah. There. Yeah. This movie has a lot of cool LA shots. A lot of varied light based shots there's a slight blue tint to a lot of this movie it's only a stylistic companion to lethal weapon another very la based mm -hmm. lightly styled movie yeah but he also does a lot of really good little like a lot of little things correctly like the, the little cha-ching as the coffin flies off the freeway <laughs> that's great that's good yeah but yeah no he does really well here you know what you better be your doctor walk away don't think just do it what are you, a brother or something? It's none of your business, man. I will fuck you up. No, you'll try. And that little experiment will end in tears, my friend. So again, for the cheap seats, do not think. Walk the fuck away. Or let you and me go outside right now. It's past my bedtime. Make a choice. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the acting and character work in this film. So let's start off with yes. Robert Downey Jr. as Harry Lockhart. Right. Uh, as we've discussed, the studio's first choice for Harry was Johnny Knoxville. Thank God he passed. Thank God. Uh, Warner Brothers also considered Benicio Del Toro, who could have been all right here. Yeah, man, like, could have been. Benicio but Del Toro is one of those guys that doesn't get to play the hero very often. He just plays a lot of scoundrels. But he would have been cool here. But I'm glad that Robert Downey Jr. got it. Obviously... Downey's neurosis turned leading man skills are on point here. <laughs> this is the kind of role he can play without trying too hard, and his bitchy coward stuff works great against straight man performances like Val Kilmer and Michelle Monaghan. It's so believable that Harry, the character, is just flying through the situation by the seat of his pants and has no idea what the yeah. hell he's doing. I mean, no, he, he brings the same kind of energy to a lot of his roles, you know, even as he plays you know characters like Tony Stark. Oh, yeah. He has some of those same he's eccentricities. A bit more vulnerable. The whole scene where he's in the back of the car uh, uh, that either um, Michelle Monaghan is driving or like, it, it's just a lot of just mounting anxiety and a lot of just, he's going through a lot at once and he's very good at conveying all of them. Yeah. Even when he's like strung out on painkillers in the, in the back yeah. seat and he's on the phone with Harmony. He's like, oh yeah, yeah I took some painkillers. Yeah. Well, where's Perry? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great yeah. scene. He's great at doing stuff like that. <laughs> we got to talk to um, him. <laughs> Also, the scene where he, he shoots Mr. Fire point blank was his first true action hero moment and probably paved the way for the rest of his career as an action hero because he really is one after this, especially in Iron Man. Yeah, for sure. Like just, I mean, we've seen him handle a gun in other films, but I think that- They're not he, like this. Not like this. Yeah. To play this character who is having to 
become like the lie he's been telling everybody that he's this yeah. private eye and such, and he lives dangerously. Like this is his moment where he has to become that even reluctantly. So, right. And then we have, of course, Val Kilmer as gay Perry. Yeah. This is confusing to me because the studio apparently wanted Harrison Ford. That's weird. Uh, I'm sorry. He declined. He would not have fit here though. No, he would. He would later do like the buddy cop thing movie with Josh Hartnett, right? The Hollywood Homicide. Well, that was 03. 03, Okay, so that was a little before. So that. he would do that. All right. So he'd already done this um, pretty much, or that type of film. He, there, there. He did a movie with with Brendan Fraser called Extraordinary Measures, which is like a drama. And there's a very climactic scene in that movie where he where he, he basically exclaims to Brendan Fraser, "I'm going and taking a crap." Yeah. So Hugh Grant was an option. Hugh Grant, W, WB considered Hugh Grant for Gay Perry, which, I mean, warmer, but I'm glad we got Val Kilmer because he does really well here, uh, especially the scenes where he has to have the upper hand from Harry. Mm -hmm. The entire definition of the word idiot scene is a classic because of the way he just wields that dialogue and he just has that force to it. A lot of scenes work because of that. Yes. Yeah. Again, just the chemistry here, like in the banter. And just the way Kilmer plays it, like one moment that I'm thinking of is whenever they get news that Harmony has committed suicide. It was, yeah. was incorrect, but Harry is distraught and he's sitting down on the pavement. And on he's the leaning, curb, right? On the curb, against yeah. Against his car. Leaning against uh, Harry's car and he's like, Harry, I really have to go. And he's like patting him on the shoulder and then just pushes him away and drives off. <laughs> yeah. But just little moments like that. like that. I mean, he knows what kind of movie this is. He knows how to play these jokes. And so I, I can definitely exactly. see that he would have been able to have had a really promising career as, in more comedic type role. Oh, yeah. He would have been great in all this. It's, it's funny because I read I read um, when doing my my research for this one that apparently Val Kilmer and Robert Downey Jr. met up at a party like a month or so before he was offered the role in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Mm -hmm. And so they knew each other casually from that. And once Val Kilmer was cast and found out that he'd be doing the work with Robert Downey Jr., he was overjoyed because they got along really well. And as a show of solidarity uh, throughout the entire production, because Robert Downey Jr. was coming off of alcoholism and drug use, and he was trying to remain sober over the course of this shoot. And Val Kilmer uh, swore off all of the drugs and alcohol with him for this shoot. They would go through it clean together. So that was a nice move. So they got Michelle Monaghan as Harmony Faith Lane. Not only does Michelle Monaghan have a fantastic character in this, but she has some definite acting moments and great reads that remind me of her potential as an actress that was wasted on like 20 female lead roles and things. Because there's that's the next decade or so of her career, being the female lead in male-centric movies. And she's fantastic. A really dynamic the scene where she's explaining her sister's death and whereabouts to Harry, where she's really frantic. That's some of her best work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great scene because she's bouncing off a very similarly unstable Harry, but she's just doing great reads and great emotional stuff. Yeah, no, she is. The only, the only little quibble that I have is that I wish that her character didn't have to say Harry's name so much because Mm -hmm. it's a lot, but I think she is absolutely nailing this role and she's so, Mm -hmm. she's so good at, she okay, so like the last thing that I remember seeing her in was True Detective season one. Oh, okay. And like you said, it's a, it's a that is a very male centric show. Yeah. But she has a good bit of screen time, and she has a, like a character that really gets to have some authentic moments, and you know is dealing with something on her own. And I and I think that she just is really really stellar. And I'm trying to think what I'd seen her in up to this point, but mm-hmm. this was around the time just a couple of years later she'd be in Source Code. Gone, baby, gone. Uh, she was in. She was the female lead in Pixels. Pixels. She was Tom Cruise's wife in the Mission Impossible movies. She's the female lead in Due Date. Ah, she right. She's the female lead in Eagle Eye. She is one yes. of the female leads in Heartbreak Kid. Born. Source Code. She was the female lead uh, in. Oh, just before this, and, she had an uncredited role in Constantine. Oh, interesting. And before that, oh. The Born Supremacy. Yeah. So she doesn't get to really lead mo- movies very often without some man getting in the way mm-hmm. but she's amazing here and that she should have done more roles like this rather than lackey shit yeah and we have corbin bernson as the villain okay. as harlan dexter so this was a weird career point for corbin bernson because you know la law was over the major league sequels were wrapped mm-hmm. bernson to this point because this was 2003 2004 he had just done two consecutive seasons of celebrity mole on abc uh, hmm. One in Hawaii, one in Yucatan. Okay. For those of you listening, The Mole was a reality show that ABC did. 
where they would get like 12 or 14 contestants out on a tr race around the world. And it would be like, you know, 13 of them are playing the game for money. And one of them is actually trying to sabotage everybody else. Oh, it is such okay. an underrated competition reality show. I loved every single version of it. They did. And they did a couple of um, celebrities and like, like D lister celebrities. Like the first season was like Kathy Griffin, Kim Coles, Keisha Knight Pulliam. And the two people that were on both celebrity seasons were Corbin Burnson and Stephen Baldwin. <laughs> and both of them didn't get very far on either. But Corbin's whole thing on this show, because there was one in Hawaii, one in Yucatan, uh, Mexico. Uh, both the times he was the wacky sort of concession on this. He was trying to search for all these bogus clues as to who the mole would be and acting wackily for screen time. He had this mm. captain's hat. Uh, I'm glad for her, for his sake that Shane Black came calling because he was doing a lot of messy shit like this. <laughs> so I think it was, I can't remember when, it was in the 90s. But he was doing the these uh, dentist horror films. Oh yeah, he was doing that. I, I mean, really, that and Major League are yeah. probably like his his most notable roles that I can think yeah, of. Yeah, that sounds about right. But yeah, but he's all right here. He's all right here. It's just uh, it, it's really not a big part. No, it's not really a developed villain, really. Not really. But he does nail the line, Captain Fucking Magic. Captain Fucking Magic. And we have uh, Larry Miller in a small role here as Dabney Shaw. Yeah. To me, Larry Miller is best known as the dad from 10 Things I Hate About You. He's so good in that. And he's one of those great character actors from the late 90s and early 2000s. He can do a, a number of fun roles like this. He's good here. He's not in many scenes in this movie. No. But he's he's pretty good as the sort of Hollywood agent type or the Hollywood casting director type. So Yeah. Before this, the one that I remembered him from was The Nutty Professor. Oh, yeah. He was like the, the dean or something or something. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention Seinfeld. He, oh, yeah. He's the doorman at this right. hotel. Can I help you? Yeah, I'm just uh, going up to see Elaine Venice. Venice. There's no one here by that name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's, uh, she's house-sitting for Mr. Pitt. Oh, house-sitter. Yeah. Mm. What are you, the boyfriend? <laughs> here for a quickie? <laughs> And we have Shannon Sossaman as Pink Hair Girl, who's in this for a hot minute. Yeah, she was in A Knight's Tale as... Um, Jocelyn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jocelyn. Uh, it's it's weird. It, 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 it's, I say this ironically. It's funny how she didn't have much of a career after A Knight's Tale, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, she also had a pretty big part in that, what was it, uh, Roles of Attraction. She was Lauren. Oh, okay. She was one of the main characters in that. After this, I don't really remember her, but uh, Young Harry and Young Harmony, played by some interesting yeah, young, people. This is very interesting. Young Harry is played by Robert Downey Jr.'s actual son, mm -hmm. which is cool. And Young Harmony is played by Ariel Winter of Modern Family fame. You're, you're doing a watch of Modern Family right now, aren't you? I am. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Se I'm five seasons in, really enjoying it. It's, I mean, I watched it casually back in the day when it was on. Mm. It's not bad. Yeah, it's it's a fine show. It's it's, it's got some solid characterizations. I love the dynamic stuff in that. Yeah, it's got some good jokes, um, some funny storylines, oh yeah. solid representation as well. Yeah, we got some good Remember music it. in this. We've got John oh, Ottman yeah. doing the music here. Uh, I like his score. I like his score it's too. Just enough. And I was reading some of his notes on his website about this, and apparently, like this was just wild fun for him, like doing this oh, particular. Good. You know, given given this like noirish feel to it, but also yeah. uh, keeping that kind of subdued or a little kind of the underbelly of the, of the score a lot of saxophone like he just said yeah. being able to bring out all of this to prop up the, the tone and tell the story he just thought it was just a delight right. i only have a couple of pop music notes in this one the, the song we hear because it's, it's a lot of christmas music a lot of traditional christmas music in this movie i'm not going to denote all of that because it's christmas music it's not the kind of thing that people search out you know to listen to on the norm uh the, the only like contemporary pop stuff uh the scene where we find harry in mid robbery in the East Village uh, is Christmas in the City by Pismo. And as Harry hides under the couch as Mr. Fire shoots Shannon Sossaman, Cheryl Crow's cover of Blue Christmas is heard playing diegetically. How random. <laughs> okay. The song that closes out the movie. Oh, yeah. It's sung by Robert Downey Jr. Yes, it is, because he was recording The Futurist this year, <laughs> which was his album in 2005. I had um, no idea that yes. that he he sang it all. But this is the song "Broken." He when oh yes he does when he was that was one of the things about his recovery that you know because he was just trying to figure out you know what what do I do when I'm not drinking what do I do to keep sober and he recorded an album <laughs> it didn't exactly sell well but he's proud of it because it was something he could do completely clean yeah and he occasionally sings like 
there's a YouTube video of uh, Sting in concert, and it was him and Robert Downey Jr. duetting on uh, Driven to Tears, which is... Oh, wow. Oh, I love that song, because I like The Police a lot. I have all their albums, and um, that's a very good Police number. But, I'll try to find um, a clip. Yeah, no, it, it, it should still be on YouTube. How can you say that you're not responsible? What does he have to do with me? What should it be? Confronted by this list is a chastity. Driven to tears. Driven to tears. Driven to tears. He's very much, uh, <clears throat> like Russell Crowe, he's very much has this sort of classic rock mindset of like a being a, of, of lead singing. He works really well from what I've heard from him, although there is a line in Civil War, actually. This may not be an exact uh, reference, but when um, Robert Downey Jr. comes back into the compound with a lot of the locked up members of Team Cap, Jeremy Renner is is sarcastically clapping, going, the Futurist is here, everybody, which is a reference to the name of the album. The oh, I did not know that. Well, there yeah, you go. So that's, now that's you a- know, and knowing he's after that. All right. Some of these uh, memorable or key scenes, like there, there are a lot here, like in this oh movie. God. But you pulled out a few to for us yeah, to talk I, about. I, this is more than I usually pull out from most movies. Yeah, there's a lot of just. I'm like, okay, that's a good scene. That's a good scene. That's also a good scene. Okay, the initial scene of Harry uh, running out of a botched robbery job and right into an audition for Dabney. It's the exact scene he's running from that's being scripted, and it's his intense emotion that makes <laughs> it captivating, not only in scene but also like for Dabney. So it's, it's really interesting. It, it sort of just captures the meta Hollywood in Hollywood take on the film that Shane Black's going for. Yeah. And the person that's reading with him is doing a great job too. Like she's really yeah. projecting a lot of intensity. That's almost triggering yeah. to him. Jesus. Oh no, no, we're not ready for you yet, sir. Will you please go back out? Wait with the others. Grace, do me a favor. Let's just take him. He's ready. You're ready, right? You're ready. Okay. Come on. You know the setup? Got any questions? Huh. He's got no questions. Look at him. Let's go. Come on. Let's read. Where is he? Where's Raphael? Where is he? Where is he? Um, uh, beat up on me all night. You want me to give up my partner? You can go spit. Quit acting like the good guy jerk off. You got your partner killed. He was in over his head. You knew it. You may as well have pulled the trigger. You killed him. No, I, I didn't. I didn't kill him. He wanted in. Why? I didn't want him to come in, and he insisted. I said, "You got to stay at home." But he doesn't listen. He's such a stupid son of a bitch. Uh, I killed him, didn't I? Oh my God! I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Sorry. Hey, good luck. See, this is what I'm talking about. Old school method. The studio. Brando. I also think that the um, scene with Harry and Army, the spider on the tit scene, mm-hmm. where uh, Harmony basically says that, because it's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, Harry tries to knock a spider off of Harmony's boob, and Harmony, who is in mid-rest, thinks that Harry was trying to cop a field. Right. And... It's an excellent character moment for both Harry and Harmony. It affirms Harry's place as Harmony's protector and the trust that Harmony is putting in Harry to solve this case. It's also an act transition scene because right after this, he pisses on the corpse. One of my favorite scenes in this movie. Oh it's God. so this, goddamn this funny. <laughs> just the back and forth between Perry and Harry of just, it's two different scenes and it's two different settings and it's, but it's still very much a, a very fluid argument and a very fluid back and forth scene. It's great too. Um, like just how they, how the corpse is revealed to the audience because yeah. Harry's peeing and then we just, we pull back and yeah. we just see it in the lower fr- uh, right yeah. frame. And then he spins to see it and he's still peeing and you can see like the pee hitting the corpse and it's so damn it's funny. It's so funny. It is so <laughs> funny. Say again, they gave her back. Yes. She's in my shower. I'm looking at her for Christ's sake. That's impossible. They don't even know you. They couldn't No, possibly. they couldn't. You're right. And since the body can't be here and this is all a dream. And oh, look, there's Alma the Elf. Good morning, Alma. What's in your basket? Shut up. How did they get in? I don't know. I mean, how am I supposed to know how they got in the virus gate, maybe? Okay, first things first. We got to move her somewhere. 
You got gloves? Excuse me? Gloves. Do you have gloves? You have to move her. If it's a frame-up, some asshole's probably calling the cops on you right now. Do this. Wrap up the body in a blanket, a sheet, anything. Okay, okay. Uh, any particular kind of gloves? Yes. Fawn. Will you fucking hurry? Perry. Yeah? I peed on it. What? What? You peed on what? I peed on the corpse. Can they do, like, ID from that? I'm sorry, you you peed on... On the corpse, and my question is... No, my question. I get to go first. Why in perfect hell would you pee on a corpse? I didn't intend to. It's not like I did it for kicks. God, this isn't happening. You said this doesn't happen. This is your fault. The entire park shootout, where it's... Perry is on a stakeout, and then a couple of the goons and the pink-haired girl get tied up in this, and then it just turns into the goons driving after Perry. Mm -hmm. And it's the Rube Goldberg of Harmony's gun going off, Perry moving out of the way was impeccably shot and edited. I thought that was just a really captivating action scene. Yeah. I also love the entire interrogation Perry and Harry have of the goon, <laughs> where Perry and Harry are showing their hand and bickering too much and showing that they're not exactly as intimidating as they should be. Oh, but, this is a great scene. Oh, my God. It's beautifully written and orchestrated, right down to the Russian roulette trick, which... <laughs> Tell us where Harmony is. Fuck you, Mary. <laughs> you don't get it, do you? This isn't good cop, bad cop. This is fag and New Yorker. You're in a lot of trouble. For Christ's sake, who are you protecting? It's all over. Finney, Dexter's going down. I know about Veronica's lawsuit. I know Dexter was facing ruin. I even know he switched daughters. Which, for God's sake, actually did work for a while till last week. Yeah, what happened then? He had to kill her, huh? Harry, will you put hey, a sock in there? I just can't ask a question. No, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, if you ask questions, then it seems like we don't know anything, like we're okay, fishing. Okay, okay. okay. Right, right, sure. And for the record, it was the boyfriend, the guy who flew in from Paris. He would have spotted the fake Sorry. and said, that's not Veronica. Okay? okay? Am I right? Fuck you. Oh, he's Exactly. Right. So Dexter had Veronica killed, threw a dress on her, dumped the body, and walked away clean, except for one little thing. Underpants. One tiny little pair of undies. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's funny, huh? I'm gonna break your nose now. Okay. Oh. I want you to picture a bullet inside your head. Can you do that for me? Fuck you. Anyway, that's ambiguous. Ambiguous? No, I don't think so. No, I think he means that when you say picture it inside your head, okay, is that a bullet will be inside your head or picture it in your head? Like Harry, an image. Shut up? He's got Look, a point. I don't know anything about a girl, seriously. I was bluffing. You know what? I think that you are bluffing right now. Harry, what are you doing? Well, what I'm doing for the guy who likes to bluff is I'm playing a little game called Am I Bluffing? Huh? Where is she? Where the fuck is Harmony? Harry. You wanna play hardball? I can do that. Where is the girl? What did you just do? I just, I put in one bullet, didn't I? I you put, put a live round in that gun. Oh yeah, there was like an 8% chance. Eight percent. Was it just eight? 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 Yeah. Who taught Man, you math? Who taught Words. you math? <laughs> So good. <laughs> He's still like trying um, to figure that out and calculating it so in his good. head. And I also love the climactic highway sequence. Hanging from the highway sign, from the corpse, hanging out of the coffin, the fucking ca the captain fucking magic line. So much anticipation and exaltation and brilliant editing as well, as well as cementing RDJ's status as a de definitive action hero. Yeah, yeah, because he he takes down uh Harlan Dexter and Oh my god every goon and every villain that's there. Yeah. But he, he also, literally just says no and shoots the guy. That's great. Although he yeah. still gets shot. Yes, he does. And there's which that, is a funny reveal. It's a funny reveal. Yeah. Cause you think, well, Harmony pulls that, you know, dying. The book caught it, but it, it's completely subverts that trope because it goes through the book. Goes through the book. Yeah. So Jordan, the extra, of the movie award goes to whom? Okay. The shootout in MacArthur park. Mm -hmm. The gun goes off. The car goes flying into the tent. The plainclothes cop in the taco cart has a cutaway line and he nails it. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> then he has more grumbly dialogue as he shoots Mr. Frying Pan. <laughs> I'm like, who is this guy? And why are we only getting this much of him? <laughs> I like, and does he make good tacos? <laughs> I like that our selections or your selection so far up to this point, it's like the people who, who have like one line that just... And they nail that line. That person was really overachieving when they <laughs> when they belted out that I go line. back to the guy from The Fugitive. The one guy was like, hey, what the hell is going on around here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if we if we tallied up all the, the extra oh extras of the movie's awards, that guy would take the taco. Oh, yes. <laughs> you never forget your first one. Yeah, so that is Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Final thoughts, Jordan? I like this movie a lot. I don't like it as much as Long Kiss Goodnight or Nice Guys, but I love the characters. I love the banter. I love the action. I love how Shane Black shoots and edits this movie. 
I love how fun and how anti Hollywood and anti form this movie can be. I, I have my quibbles with how they portray a gay character and mm-hmm. little things that I've talked about. Yeah. But I still really like this one. It's a lot of fun and it's definitely one of Shane Black's best films. This movie is for the most part, a great masterclass in great writing, sharp oh, dialogue, yeah. great exchanges back and forth. But also what something this film does really well is part of it's the pacing. We cover a lot of territory uh, and the story moves very, very quickly. And so there's really not a moment to even be bored. Everything's always moving. Like every time the characters are trying to get from A to B, there's something that, you know, that gets in their way that derails them for a minute. And I think just the way it balances how it presents the action, but also the the more lighthearted or humorous moments. I think the action comedy genre is, I mean, th- that could be almost a genre unto itself. Oh yeah. I think this movie it does it does that really well. This is a great freshman effort in the director's chair by Shane Black. I think there are moments where I still laugh out loud. Like it's still really damn funny. And it's just a good time. Yeah, it's a blast. Yeah. And now, coming soon to video cassette. What is it you've done, Raymond? Murder, father. Why did you murder someone, Raymond? For money. Who did you murder for money, Raymond? You, father. After I killed them, I walked home to await instructions. Get to Bruges. 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 Where's that? It's in Belgium. For two weeks in Bruges, in a room like this, with you? No way. Been to the top of the tower? Guidebook says it's a must see. Well, you ain't going up there. Why? It's all windy stairs. I'm not being funny. What exactly are you trying to say? They're a bunch of elephants. Mr. Blakely? Yes. You have a message. Number one, why aren't you in when I told you to be in? You better be in when I can call again, or there'll be now to pay up, I'm telling you. He swears a lot, doesn't he? Let's go out. Go out where? The pub. Yes. Harry, I've got an idea. I'm going to go back to my room, jump into the canal, see if I can escape. If you go outside and round the corner, you can shoot at me from there and try and get me. I'll go outside then which way, right or left? You go right, don't you? Okay, on the count of one, two, three, go. Who says it? Oh, you say it. You guys are crazy. One, two, three, go! Ray, you're about the worst tourist in the whole world. If I'd grown up on a farm and was retarded, Bruges might impress me, but I didn't, so it doesn't. She ain't my girlfriend. She's a prostitute. Didn't know there were any prostitutes in Bruges. Just had to look in the right places. Brothels are good. An Uzi. I'm not from South Central Los Angeles. I want a normal gun for a normal person. Maybe that's what hell is. The entire rest of eternity spent in Bruges. Back off, shorty. You don't know karate. Ah! All right, it's that time to give a special shout out to our casual and preferred renters over on Patreon. Lewis, Mike, and Jack from Random Movie Roulettes. Mondo, Pete, Ryan M, Ryan S, Jacob and Tab from Test Pattern, Naomi and Rich from Bloody in Love, James, Zach, and Mark. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thank you all so much for supporting the show. Patronage goes towards helping us offset the cost of hosting and producing this show. If you're not a patron but are interested in becoming one, head over to patreon.com slash video for more information about all the great perks you can get starting at $2 a month, such as bonus episodes not available on our main feed, commentaries, and a super cool gift pack loaded with Veracon video merch and other little surprises. Remember to rate and review the show on iTunes if you have any questions, suggestions, or just want to tell us what you think of the show. Drop us a line at VeraconVideo at gmail.com. You can DM us on Twitter at Veracon Video, or you can call us and leave a message on the Veracon Video hotline at 312-620-5560. That's all for today, but we'll be back soon to talk about more forgotten and unforgettable movies pulled from the shelves right here at Veracon Video. So long, everybody. That's it. Please stay for the end credits. And to all the good people in the Midwest, I'm sorry we said fuck so much. Goodbye, Vietnam! That's right. I'm history. I'm out of here. I got the lucky ticket home, baby. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jenny. Bye-bye, boy. Have fun storming the castle. Bye-bye. Do take good care of yourself. What is this, your farewell speech? Going home. Have a good trip. Hasta la vista, baby. I have to go. Adieu, auf Wiedersehen, Gesundheit. 